Welcome to the Robotics Through Science Fiction podcast. And today we have Dr. Ian Tregillis, a physicist by day and the author of Thought-Provoking Science Fiction by Night. His latest series, The Alchemy Wars, is about a robot, Jax, caught in the aftermath of the Protestant Reformation. So Ian, tell us about yourself and your day job. Um, hi, um, thank you for the opportunity. This is really fun. Um, yeah, as you said, I um, in my day job, um, I'm a physicist at Los Alamos National Laboratory. I don't work on robotics. I know nothing about it, honestly. Um, my background is in astrophysics, uh, but now I work in a plasma physics research group at Los Alamos. We do a lot of experiment design, um, basically um, computer modeling, which is also what I did for my, my PhD. So um, I sit and stare at a screen all day, basically is the long and short of it. So plasma physics, and then we're doing, you know, the Protestant Reformation and a religious war between <laughs> free will and predestination. I love Charlie Jane Andrews' quote. She said, I've never rooted for the Catholic Church <laughs> by re reading this book, which is like a science fiction book, really? Yeah, I guess you could say I don't, um, my, my day job and my writing life don't, you know, they don't overlap very much, um, but, th but that's by design. Um, you know, writing is my, it's a thing I do for fun at the end of the day. So, um, yeah, if I, if I try to write hard science fiction, it, A, I wouldn't be very good at it, and B, it would feel like homework. You know, it would feel like I had to make it really rigorous, and it would have to pass peer review. So, you know, that wouldn't be very fun. But if you throw magic into a story, then you know you're going to fail peer review from the get-go. So then it, you know, you, you get more freedom that way. Yeah, I really love the, the steampunk. It was a really nice touch there. But going back, you know, not to grade you or anything, but do you think that robots will eventually have free will? I'm sorry, you cut out a little bit. Were you asking about free will? Yeah, do you think robots will eventually oh. have free will? Um, yeah, um, again, prefacing my, you know, my answer with my, utter lack of knowledge about the field, but um, if, if, if you'll grant me the conceit that I think free will is a not understood emergent phenomenon, then absolutely. I think we see, we already see emergent phenomena in certain, you know, computational systems. I mean, even in a computer model, um, which is not AI and it's not robotics, we very often see things where we have to, it takes a lot of work to unpeel why we're getting what we're getting. Um, and so, and those are relatively simple compared to, you know, a neural net or something that's supposed to be emulating consciousness. So yeah, absolutely. I think there will be behaviors that we just, that seem spontaneous and like free will. And that, get, <clears throat> excuse me, and that gets into the whole field of behavior-based robotics, which looks a lot about, you know, behaviors, what's going underneath the surface, all these competing sub processes with, with there. Uh, and that kind of gets into that uh, idea of the trolley problem that the philosophers are always going on about. Oh, yeah. How would a robot choose between killing one person for sure in order to save lots of people? And so how did Jax handle that? Or more appropriately, how did you as the actor <laughs> handle that one? Um, well, you know, I kind of stumbled my way into confronting questions like that. Um, in the course of writing the book, you know, as I was plotting out the overall story in various scenes. Um, and I, I didn't really, I didn't know that, you know, there was a class of problems and there was this famous problem called the trolley problem. I just kept running up against things that I later realized were variations on this theme. Um, and I definitely... You know, people much smarter than I have wrestled with that problem for a long time, so I definitely did not solve it. Um, what I, you know, the strategy that I, that I landed on was to try to figure out what would the people, because this is what the story needed, what would the people who were building the clackers in the Alchemy Wars, how would they solve the trolley problem? You know, are these analogous problems? doesn't matter what I think. Well, what would they think? And it helped that I had already sort of developed a world where they were largely pragmatically amoral. So that it was easy to say, oh, well, you know, they would have their machines. Like if it was a ship sinking, 
you know, the clackers would start doing these calculations based on what is the insurance policy on all the cargo and how expensive is the cargo and which passengers are more likely to shoot to, to um, try to sue the, you know, the shipping company. And, you know, so then you can sort of um, gloss over a lot by saying, oh, well, there's a very complicated hierarchy of how they would, who they would save and who they would let die, you know, and then if people want to ask more complicated questions than that, then, you know, that's in the, you know, in the famous words of Raymond Chandler, that's when you have someone run into the room with a gun, right, and kind of draw the attention elsewhere. So that's, that's my weaselly solution to the trolley problem. <laughs> and I loved it because that's a lot of what we do in the behavior-based programming and the, these uh, independent behaviors and they can change the gains and external process can say, well, this one's now more important than the other one because of the context. And huh. so starting to see those schemas, subconscious. Also, there's been a lot of work in the, the more classical AI robotics versus the more we're making robots look like humanoids and lots of joints and stuff. In the AI side, looking a lot at modeling on the amygdala and in those types of controlling processes. And we actually think that emotions uh, are in a very important, very fundamental control function to handle all of these competing goals and needs. Now, whether or not a robot would have enough time to do those computations, no one's pretty sure on it. So most of the people who do field robotics, like I do, look at the trolley problem and say, uh, guys, you understand it's going to be whatever they, the robot sees and can react to fast enough. It's not like we go down the interstate going, oh, the car in front of me has a child and the other car has, has a carpool, you know, and therefore I will swerve to the left. It's more like, holy crap, I don't, you know, and then you do it, right? You know, and so we're thinking the robots are going to do something like that. So anyway, that was... Makes sense. Yeah, but... Uh, Thinking about the, the trolley problem, I, which I guess trolley kind of goes with a nice uh, ping pong, going back to the... When I go to the Netherlands quite a bit for collaborative research, and I started reading the mechanical right after one of my trips, and the descriptions of Amsterdam and the Netherlands were so spot on, I immediately assumed you were Dutch, and that it had been translated. So, are you Dutch, or do you physicists, plasma physicists, hang out in Holland a lot? I um, have been to the continent a few times, but never the, never in the Netherlands. I've never been to Holland, never been to Amsterdam. I've never been to The Hague. Um, you know, I've been to the airport in Amsterdam, but um, on my way other places. But I've never had the opportunity to stay. So uh, thank you. I'm, I'm glad I was able to fool you. Um, you know, Google, when you're writing fiction, Google Street View is your friend. <laughs> <laughs> Really? So you're not just like looking Google, you're like looking at the street view and getting a view of that. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's it's fun that way. You get a sense of, of course, you know, the, the cities in the books are, you know, the world is radically different from the world we know. But, you know, I, I sort of, I use the same map <laughs> for sure. And it's fun that way. Although I did, I did, using street view, I did violate a few things because um, certain landmarks are definitely in the world of the alchemy wars that are there in our world. And there are places where, for the sake of artistic license, I describe someone standing in one place and seeing something that they could not pause. All you have to do is look at the satellite view and you can say, oh, there's no way they could see that. But, you know, hopefully not all readers are that nitpicky. Yeah, I was gonna say most, I, I have never looked at a satellite map while I was reading fiction. So <laughs> you know, that could just be a Robin thing. That, that may be just a failing of mine. <laughs> I, I hope I hope you're not unique in that way. Yeah. Now, here's one that you couldn't have done with Google Street Maps, or maybe maybe you could. Maybe there's something I don't know about. Because in addition to the Alchemy Wars, you've written a Detective Nor book set in heaven. Oh yeah. More than night. So how would you do that? Um, yeah, you're right. Google Street View was not um, very helpful for that one. Um, uh, that one was. Um, I had, there's a conceit in the book where one character speaks in sort of a 1930s detective patois. Um, it's, it's, I'll call it a, a Chandler pastiche because I don't, I would never claim that it rises to the level of homage. But for that one, I read a ton of Raymond Chandler and a ton of Deschel Hammett and James M. Cain. And I assembled kind of a, a 1930s slang glossary um, so that I could sort of 
develop the pattern for this particular character. Um, that was actually a lot of work because there are sort of noir slang glossaries online, but they're intended to help someone reading, you know, a very obscure noir novel um, with, with obscure slang in it. Um, but if you're writing it, you need a reverse lookup glossary, right? Because you need to say, okay, he's going to say this, but how would I put that in 1930s jargon? So that, that took a bit of work. Um, but then once I had that, it was actually the easiest book I've written because, uh, you know, a lot of the noir novels have sort of a set pattern, right? The plots are not super original. So, you know, I just identified what all the Lego blocks of 1930s noir plot were, and I just stuck the blocks together in a different order. Um, so that, that was fun. It went pretty fast once I had the blocks. Well, that's amazing. It sounds like you're also kind of like finding a, a, an application for somebody to write an app to do a reverse lookup on, on NOR terminology. So that's, well, that's actually a cool idea. <laughs> I love that idea. You know, it, it, and we need a cut of it, whoever does that and gets their 99 cents of an app, an instance. So, but, uh, you know, a common thread there is religion. So what is it about your books and religion? Um, that's a fair question. Um, I don't, it's not intentional. Um, you know, I'm not, um, I guess what you would call a particular religious person. Um, you know, it's something more than night. Um, I, what I will say is I'm very mercenary. And so something more than night, the sort of medieval Christian heaven with the, the hierarchy of angels. And um, it's just such a wonderful fantasy setting. It's like this prepackaged world that's so fantastical. How could anyone resist using it? Uh, so, and then um, in the Alchemy Wars, I had started developing the world, and I knew that the major change to history was going to happen in the Netherlands, you know, in the late 1600s. And um, I was looking at it from the sort of scientific point of view. Um, around the time of Christian, I always say Huygens, I believe it's Huffens. I get corrected on that a lot. I apologize to your Dutch listeners um, and uh, Isaac Newton. But a friend of mine said, oh, well, if you're telling a story that starts there, you know, the Netherlands and France were at war at the time, and it was the Protestants and the Catholics. And I realized, well, gosh, that has to become the backdrop for the whole thing. So um, I, I kind of bumbled into that one. <laughs> and it works great. And, and uh, again, I think one of my favorite characters of all time will always be Berenice. Oh, great. That she's just what a what a strong profane woman, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Abercell Christian in the uh, in the expanse. Just yeah, what are you really thinking, huh? You know, <laughs> presses herself. She she um she was definitely the character who sprang fully formed, you know, from the page. Um, I describe Berenice as the kind of person who she's usually the smartest person in the room, but that gets her into trouble because she's used to being this. She's so dependent on her own intelligence that she's over reliant on it. I, I describe her as someone who would, you know, if the airplane is on fire, not that they have airplanes in this world, but if the airplane is on fire, she'll jump out without a parachute and, you know, thinking, okay, I don't have a parachute, but you know, I'm really smart. I'll figure something out on the way down. And she manages to get by that way, but she often gets herself into trouble that way too. She does too, but it's it's great. It makes a a, fanta a wonderful story, fantastic in the good sense, not like fantastical in the bad, <laughs> of, of so unrealistic. All right. So back to this idea of free will. If Thomas Aquinas showed up at your house, what would you do or ask him? Since so much of your book is on free will. Let's see. Is it like newly risen from the grave? Um, Thomas Aquinas, or is he has he been around for a while and has he had time to acclimate to the 21st century? Uh, your call. I, I got the question out there. You, you you can make it into a softball or whatever you want. <laughs> um, okay, so assuming that he's not a zombie, then because um, uh, my reaction would be different. Um, you well, know, I, running. I think running is a good one if he's. Yeah, I'd run probably. Um, Double tap. You know, yeah, to, yeah, if, yeah, yeah. If I had a crowbar behind the door, um, if he'd been around for, if he was, if he'd had time to get used to the 21st century, I would actually, it would be interesting to ask him. You know, you've, you, you just, you know, given 
what Thomas Aquinas was what the 13th century. So it's been like 800 years. You've seen how the world has changed. Have people changed? That'd be a very interesting question to ask him. And regardless of that, given how the world has changed and how people have or haven't changed, have your conclusions, have your conclusions changed? You know, do your five proofs of the existence of God still hold up? You know, do your, the belief in, um, uh, knowledge through revelation and knowledge through the human senses, does that all still hold? Um, you know, does the way the world has evolved, does it support your thesis? I think that'd be interesting to hear, although I don't speak medieval Spanish, Italian or Latin, so I wouldn't understand the answer anyway, right? Yeah, I, I like the way that you're putting him on a, a public thesis defense. I <laughs> yeah, grilling you. We, we got you. I, I like that. There's a, that strong academic feel in there. I read in one of your interviews that you're a friend, uh, a fan rather, of Roger Selassny, who was sort of the Neil Gaiman of his day for people who may not be familiar with Selassny's work. Have you read the, his, his uh, short story for Breath, I Terry, which is a robot version sort of a Joe Faust, The Last Temptation of Christ, and Jesus is all rolled into one? Um, I had not been familiar with it until um, when we were corresponding earlier this week. So then I um, quickly went off and read it earlier this week. Um, but I had not come across it until we started talking. So what do you think of that? Boy, he's a lasny. Wow, oh. man. I said, boy, he's a lasny. What boy. Um, that is, you know, I also, I think I see some um, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner in that one as well. Um, Although I don't, I don't know if that's, I may have been misreading it, but you know, there's like the, there's the ore crusher robot who has to keep stopping all the other robots to tell his story. Um, struck me as, as rhyming the ancient mariner a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, I thought, it, I, I, it struck me as, I don't know when he wrote it, but it's sort of very much in the vein of um, other kind of explorations in his his oeuvre, right, of combining the, you know, very technical and science fictional um, trappings with, with religion and philosophy. Um, you know, his, his great, to me, one of his great works is um, Lord of Love, which is inherently that same idea. Um, but the, I guess I don't know what I think about this one for Breath I Terry. Um, maybe, maybe I read it too, I haven't given it enough time to digest. Um, he, uh, yeah, I don't know. Every time I read Zelazny, I think, man, I'm never going to be that good. <laughs> yeah, he really, he was the first to really get into the mythology, into the retelling. And so I had just recently run across it myself because, you know, I'd read all uh, Zelazny. I, I think uh, Call Me Conrad uh, is one of the best, you know, one of my top novels, I think, there. And, and to see this idea of what is those all of his books have been about humans doing human things or reinsertion into a different interpretation of the different religious traditions. And this one is like, oh, you know, robots with that whole Colossus the Corbin project, you know, Uber robot uprising thing mixed in there. So it's kind of interesting. Well, rats, we're running out of time. So one last question. If you had us read one non-Alchemy Wars book of yours, which one do you recommend? Um, well, you know what? I guess that, that's, uh, that's an easy one because um, I have one standalone novel. So one book would be the standalone, Something More Than Night, for sure, which is very divisive among my small readership, but it's, it's my favorite book of what I've read. Well, excellent. I look forward to reading that. Thank you so much for being with us. And if you're listening, Joe Williams, our site runner, has asked me to remind you to subscribe to the Robotics Through Science Fiction YouTube channel and our newsletter so that you can get updates and alerts. Thank you all. And thank you, Ian. Oh, thank you. It's my pleasure very much.